Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, this opportunity. Um, Jessica and I started within about six months of each other, actually, and I just had my 11-year anniversary with the Attorney General's office yesterday, if you can believe that. And so we really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, interact with other lawyers, and uh, we always find out that there are a lot of questions about the Attorney General's office and a lot of uh, uh, maybe misconceptions sometimes, and so we find this to be a very valuable thing to do. Um, we are, uh, we're going to kind of tag team this, and so I'm going to go through kind of a general uh, PowerPoint just about the office in, in general, and, uh, and then Jessica has some information that's more about financial services. Um, just a couple of things. We really do encourage questions. Uh, I know everybody says that. We, we really mean it. Uh, we find that, I find that to be one of the best parts of the, of the public speaking. And so if you have questions at any time during this, feel free to raise your hand, interrupt, uh, you know, uh, because we, we really do welcome that. And, um, and the other thing is, and this is a standard disclaimer, but, you know, anything that I say today or that Jessica says today, you know, that belongs to us. These are our personal opinions. They don't belong to our boss, uh, Attorney General Tom Miller. Um, and, uh, and I don't think either of us are afraid to express opinions. And so, uh, so, we, <clears throat> so we just want to make clear that... Um, that we're responsible for our own comments. Um, both Jessica and I have spent, I think, most of our time in the office working on financial services issues. Um, that is, uh, wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, you know, when I first came to, to the office, I didn't know a lot about financial services. And, and I've learned, uh, quite a bit since then. And so it, it really has uh, been an, an amazing journey. Um, so, okay, so what is the role of the Attorney General? Um, yes, we file civil lawsuits and criminal charges on behalf of the state. Let me say something right off the bat about the criminal part. Uh, we work in what's called the Consumer Protection Division. What we do is almost exclusively civil. Now, it is possible that we could get involved in something criminal. It is possible that we may notice something criminal and we may make a referral, uh, for example, to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, I know I've personally done that. Um, it is possible that one of us could be cross-designated and could work as, on a criminal matter. Now, I've never done that. I don't, have you done that? I've done it once. Okay, Jessica's done it once. So it, it, it does come up, but as a general matter, we don't have original jurisdiction over, over criminal matters. Um, it, that lies on the state level at the county attorney level. And so we, in the normal course, would need to get a referral from a county attorney asking us to handle something uh, criminal. In fact, we have a whole team of, of attorneys that that is what they do. And so I know that we're talking about financial services and, and civil things today, but for example, um, let's say that there is unfortunately a murder that happens somewhere and it might happen in a rural area well, one, those attorneys may not feel like they're necessarily equipped for it, and very likely they might have a conflict of interest of some type because it's from small town Iowa. I'm from small town Iowa. I grew up in Spirit Lake, and so uh, I understand that. And so those attorneys travel all over the state, and they handle cases, uh, you know, when asked. And and so. Um, it, again, so it is possible that on a financial services matter or another traditionally civil matter, we could get involved, but it doesn't happen um, all that often. I, I would add, we have a, a, we have a financial 
services the prime part of our office, the very prosecutions. And sometimes we do parallel proceedings with them. And I've done that several times, especially like investment yeah. advisors. Um, an investment advisor gone rogue. Uh, we've done parallel proceedings. A lot of times the civil proceedings will get stayed at that point. Um, but they are on sort of parallel tracks. And if we find cause in our civil investigation, mm -hmm. we will refer it for criminal prosecution. Correct. So it does happen, absolutely. I don't want to give the impression that it never happens. But uh, but predominantly, and I don't know what happened to it's my deck. It's <laughs> not us. And I don't know what happened to my deck. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we'll just wait a second here. Um, so let me just go ahead. I mean, the, the primary law that, that we enforce is something that's referred to as the, the Consumer Fraud Act. Didn't touch it, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I it on okay. So, all right. So, what else do we do? We defend the state in lawsuits, and in fact, you know, most of the people who work in our office on the civil side are defense lawyers. Um, you know, we have a section that's called special litigation, and so they, uh, you know, they do a lot of work with, say, the corrections department, where we get sued by prisoners, or there's a tort that's alleged against the state in some capacity. Um, and of course, um, we have a whole big section, which we refer to as our admin section, which is the fourth bullet here of, you know, advising agencies, where their job is to be counsel for the various state agencies. And this sometimes gets confused by the public and I think the press, uh, where they don't understand that, you know, we are acting as counsel for these agencies and they will sometimes criticize us or criticize the Attorney General for different positions and saying, you know, we are taking a position and that may or may not actually be the case. Uh, you know, our client, that agency might be taking a, a certain position. And I'm sure that everybody in this room understands that, but that is a point that sometimes I think gets confused um, with, with the larger public. Um, advocating for consumer rights. So uh, we lobby uh, at, at the Capitol. Um, I know that I uh, have I mean, you have to be careful because lobbying is a defined term, uh, but that we have been asked to go over and maybe provide some information or ask questions about, about certain items. I know Jessica has done this as well, probably more than me. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if you want to add anything. issues out there and we've been heavily focused on sort of the finance um, industry mm -hmm. at least in my over 10 years, mm -hmm. my years. Um, and, and we propose lots of legislation mm -hmm. from some of the mortgage stuff mortgage foreclosure rescue um, debt collection uh, consumer credit code uh, to just standard consumer stuff like buying club laws and things like that um, we haven't been I think as active as many folks have in these last few sessions with the divided house and senate because you know we don't want to waste government time on stuff and it's not going to go anywhere. But we've still been proposing bills that we think are very bipartisan and consumer friendly and, and have been making headway. Yeah, so, absolutely. And, and we do that in addition to bills that pop up, as Patrick said, we get called over all the time. Mm -hmm. As as the Assistant Attorney General mm -hmm. and not lobbyists, we just kind of testify, answer questions, make sure they understand the law. Our division director is our lobbyist and he usually accompanies us and, and states our position on the legislation. Right. Right, so that, that's something that we do. We do train prosecutors. We have a division that that's their job. Their job is to assist the county attorneys and the prosecutors across the state, train them on various issues, provide support to them. This is, this is different than what I was talking about earlier, right? the attorneys who actually go and try the case. This is, uh, this is a support function that uh, some people in, in our office provides and assisting the public. We're the consumer protection division. So we're the one, we're the most 
public, we're the most visible, we're the one that people think about, I think, a lot when they think about an attorney general's office. And so we have two full-time receptionists who are on the phone from the moment they get in until the moment they go home. Uh, we answer more phone calls than you could ever imagine. And uh, a lot gets done in those phone calls. You know, you just walk by in the course of your day and you'll hear them saying, um, you know, oh no, that, that's a scam. You know, don't send them $2,000. And that is a very common occurrence with all the various lottery scams or just any number of different things. And, and we don't necessarily track the phone calls that we get, but just that alone, I, I can't imagine how much money that we save Iowans. And then, of course, we open files. We, we have complaints, and we formally open a complaint. And we have investigators. And um, Jessica, I don't what do we have, four or 5,000 a year, something like yeah, that? Yeah. That we that and those are the ones that we open, right? There's all kinds of other contacts. You know, somebody just talks to somebody on the phone. Maybe somebody responds to an email. So the amount of contact that our office and our division in particular has with the public is incredible, and it is, uh, I think, a very valuable service that uh, where we help a lot of people. One just not incur the loss in the first place, but there's lots of people who do incur the loss and then we help them get their money back um, whenever we can. Yeah, and we refer complaints mm -hmm. on, so if we don't think it, it's necessarily our division that has it or we think maybe another federal government agency can handle it, we, we go there. Absolutely. Um, we, we handle people who are, we have, I mean, even though we're consumer protection and we try to be limited, we get lots of random walk-ins and inquiries and and people that need help in many different ways. So if we have a right. state fair booth, you might see us out there, and that's always an interesting time. Mm -hmm. um, we've had we've had everything from just standard complaints there to people who need help about child support, and we try and help folks and get them in the right direction. To people who have seen ghosts at Fort Dodge and want us to do something, or Camp Dodge, and want us to do something about the Camp Dodge ghost and put them to rest. At that one, I was not able to help. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to tell them. Are they going to have jurisdiction over ghosts? <laughs> we get a lot of contact, we'll put it that way. Um, okay, so <clears throat> what's the main thing that the Consumer Protection do uh, Division does? Okay, well, we enforce a law that's called the Iowa Consumer Fraud Act. It's Iowa Code 714.16, and it, it's commonly referred to as a UDAP law, Unfair Deceptive Actor Practice. And these laws are in every state. Uh, they're very similar, and the Federal Trade Commission you know, out in Washington, D.C., also has a law. They're not identical, uh, but they, but there's a lot of similarity. And, and, um, and so, you know, some of this we've already talked about. Um, one of the things that we do and one of the things that I do a lot is uh, working with other states and federal agencies. And so we have a thing that we refer to as a multi-state. And it is exactly what you think it is. It is state AG offices working together uh, on an issue to try to, uh, one, reduce the transaction costs, both for us and for whoever is on the other side of that issue, but also to get um, some uniformity and a, a commonality of position. Uh, you know, federalism is a, is a wonderful thing, but it can provide some challenges. And at the end of the day, every one of us is sovereign. Every one of us is a, is a sovereign entity. And one of the things that, um, that I have spent a lot of time on, and I know Jessica does too, is I work not only with state attorney general offices, but we work with the state banking departments and then also the federal agencies. Now, we didn't work with federal agencies really at all until um, the current administration. And since that time, I have had the privilege of working very closely with uh, the United States Department of Justice, what's referred to as Maine Justice. So this is the, you know, the Robert F. Kennedy Building in Washington, D.C. And uh, I've worked with um, HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I've worked with the Treasury Department. 
Uh, I have worked with, of course, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is, you know, came along a little bit later. And we do a lot of things now, state and federal. And that is, so there are a lot of challenges there. Uh, you know, coordinating among the states, coordinating with different actual regulators, because, you know, we're different. We're, we're AG offices. We're not a regulator in the way that a state banking department is or the Treasury Department or the OCC, the Federal Office of the Comptroller. And so tremendous effort goes into this type of coordination. And um, it's not easy. Uh, no, it's sometimes referred to as herding cats. Um, but I think it benefits both us and, and um, the, the entities we're looking at. Because really, it is one point of contact, and it becomes a commonality. And you don't have to worry about the universality of, of the settlement and that you might have unfair competition, because not only are you know, you're doing it across all sort of jurisdictions, but hopefully we get, get it uniform across companies. I will add one caveat. We have always kind of worked closely with the FTC. The Federal Trade Commission and the mm -hmm. states have always worked together and, and continue to work together just because it's a natural fit with you to have. That's correct, and I, that is a good correction. <laughs> and one of the things that I think I, is that Jessica and I often find ourselves in leadership positions. And so part of that is I, you know, because our boss, Attorney General Miller, uh, is a leader in the attorney general community. He's he's been around a long time and uh, and, and has a lot of experience. and And part of it is also we've um, I think we've established our our own roles in the in the attorney general community as well. And so that can of course be extra challenging because a lot of the things that we work on, we have the privilege and the responsibility of being the leader, being the primary contact for all of the people on our side of the table, but also for the other side of the table. And um, it, it makes for interesting work. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does. Um, and I, I would just say the way, just having observed it now for, for these many years and the way it sort of works out and how we usually have an executive committee and if you've you know, gotten accustomed, it, accustomed to it, you might have a state contact that is the state and federal contact. You might have parallel contacts, one the state, one the federal. Um, but I just have some sort of thoughts as we're sitting here talking to largely sort of in-house counsel, but anyone who would, would deal inside or outside sort of with this situation and find yourself on the other side of government agencies. Um, I would say first and foremost, respond. I mean, if we're contacting you in a more friendly manner or if we've issued a civil investigative demand or a, a subpoena, either way, kind of respond to us and work with us. I think you're much better off doing that. I mean, I've seen this now over, play out over a decade, and the companies that initially want to fight us or hire, or hire sort of pit bull litigation, I only think they end up spending more money and I've seen them settle at the end of the day when I think that settlement was going to be the same regardless. And you ended up with a lot of angst and heartache at the beginning and not to mention a lot of litigation dollars. Um, I, I think we're easy to work with too, most of us. Patrick and I. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> recently at, a, at, a, at odds with this again, where they've hired a company, not the financial industry, um, has hired a sort of pit bull litigator, and he's fighting us. And number one, we're going to win. I mean, our CIP is not that broad. We try not to draft them that way. But number two, we would work with him. He doesn't have to be this confrontational, and he is running up uh, billable hours like, like no other. And it's just prolonging the fight, and it, it creates sort of a, a tension there that I don't think needs to be there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would say sort of work with us. Don't be afraid to call us and talk with us. Um, we do try and work together. We're not going to try and play feds versus states. I mean, we try and all coordinate. If there's some mis miscommunication going on, tell us. I mean, I think communication in these things is, is the biggest. And don't try and hide. I would say, again, be up front. Show us what you're doing. If you don't think we're getting something, what I found incredibly helpful lately is the state might have had a wrong idea of what's going on in a company, so a company's put on a webinar where they say walk us through their procedures. Say it's like a credit card application, and we think something's going on on how you're signing someone up. Um, we've had that walked through on a webinar, stepped through with some experienced people, not only experienced people who are doing the, the credit card sign up or who are experienced in the credit card, but also counsel and in-house people on the call to answer all of our questions. 
And wow, that looked a lot better than us trying to figure it out and go through documents, and especially because the documents were leading us maybe down the wrong path. And it actually had a better resolution for everyone. And now that company wants to do more presentations on more things just because it helped. I mean, there's, there's a fine line of just doing dog and pony shows and doing it too much. But if really you think we're confused, don't be afraid to suggest that. And with the modern technology, the webinars have been incredible in helping us sort of clarify and figuring out. And again, because it's a multi-state, you get everyone on the same page at once. You might have, you know, 50 states on that call um, figuring out what's going on and your side to say, your time to say, here, no, really, here's what's going on. It's, it's not what you think and it's not what you figured out. It's actually this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just got back last night from a meeting that I organized um, with a company that's having some challenges right now. And we had 23 people at that meeting on, on the government side, uh, state AG, state banking department, and one federal agency. And the, and the company was happy that there was 23 people there because of the efficiency of that, of the, of that communication. And the other thing I would, I would like just to add my own personal comment is about the, you know, working with us. I mean, we, we have a lot of power. I mean, that, that's just a fact, and, um, and, and, and we recognize that, and I think we respect it and, and the responsibility that, that comes with that, and at least from my perspective, I think we bend over backwards to try to work cooperatively with people and, and constructively with people whenever we can. That doesn't mean we agree on everything, it doesn't, but... Um, Sometimes you can't do that, but dealing with us is different than normal litigation, and I think that's just a, a first point that I would make and that people need to recognize that. I used to be in private practice. Jessica used to be in private practice, um, both at large law firms, and you know I think we have a sense of, of what that's like, and what, what we do is, is, is very, very different, and so... Um, if we can work with you to get to what is substantively a good result, that's what we want to get. You know, we don't have sometimes the competing financial interests that can come into play in litigation, whether it's a contingency fee for a plaintiff's firm. Um, that can happen in our world, although it's rare, um, or, or otherwise, and so uh, we are very focused on what is the right substantive outcome, because that's, that's what we want. And, and we do, don't, don't get us wrong, I mean, Patrick and I do view, as you said, financial regulation and, and you folks, not, I mean, there are some really bad actors that oh, yeah. we're not going to mm. be nice with, and they're just pure scammers, and we will help Absolutely. Them to court. But in talk, but when, when <clears throat> folks that I see in this room and that I imagine are listening to this presentation and what we do most of the time we really do want to try and solve the problem, not put you out of the industry, not bankrupt the company, um, and, or maybe discover there's not a problem. I mean, that happens every once in a while, too. It's, it's not unheard of. Yeah, I mean, we, we should, and thanks for that clarification, we, do, we deal with just crooks sometimes. I mean, you know, people who are just out there hurting people, taking their money, doing bad things. And, and we have people in our division that that's primarily what they do, and they do a great job. Uh, for me, I have dealt more with legitimate companies that there's, there's some kind of an issue, right? And obviously, those are dramatically different situations. But yes, not the people who deal with the crooks would never get up here and talk about, you know, working cooperatively and et cetera. They have a very different practice, as, as you might imagine. Um, so some of this is, you know, a little bit duplicative. We, we do obtain reimbursement for consumers. We do it on a one-off basis. You know, just one person calls in and they got scammed and they lost $500 and can you help me get my money back? That's something we do all the time. Uh, we give a very high level of service to individual Iowans. And not every state does that. As you can imagine, if you're in a larger state, they're not able to give the level of service that, that we are. Plus, quite frankly, that's the culture of our office, that I think we really try hard for everybody who contacts us. And then 
Um, can, can I add, like, sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure all of you have standardized compliance systems and complaints, um, especially now. But I saw this early on when I got there, sort of 2005, 2006, I remember this happening by two large multinational companies um, where they didn't respond to the complaint or they respond in a very pithy manner or they responded with lies. Right? I don't know who was handling their complaint. It was clearly not standardized. They didn't have a good compliance center. Um, that cost them. I, I don't know how much money because it caused a huge investigation into their practices, right? And that's and complaints are one of the ways we discover that something might be going on. And again, it only benefits you to sort of respond thoroughly. And again, I, I think all your companies do so, and I think you understand this. But I just what I don't say it, I see it happen again. Um, but you know, responding sort of honestly with the documents. I think the more documents, the better. We we like to go through paper, see what's going on. Paper trail is always good. Um, and fully responding to that complaint, not ignoring it or not giving it to someone who's not trained in, in a proper response can, can only benefit you. No, I, absolutely. And, and just the other point I would make is so we have kind of the one-off situations, the complaints, or maybe it's a small handful of people, but then we have the big settlements of which uh, I've been a part of and Jessica has been a part of. And there's often a reimbursement component to that to where you know, we may recover a very large amount of money, and then and then we have the responsibility of dispersing that money not only to Iowa but usually across the the entire nation. And that's that's something that uh, I have spent a lot of time on. And there's just this whole world that exists onto itself about settlement administration. That um, you know, and of course, private lawyers do that as well, per, mostly in class actions. Um, but uh, that's something that, you know, I think we both have, have a lot of experience with. And, and one more thing, going back to complaints, sorry, again, just trying to help um, and, and advise and, and sort of, I think it helps us both. Um, to the extent you have one person for like a government office, I think it's good to let that government office know. And I actually think it's better, you know, we have one contact at X company, at XYZ company. Um, that our complaints go to or that we know if we have a problem and just want to call them up and ask them a question that they can get it resolved. I have found that that helps tremendously, especially at the, the super large corporations, but even on the smaller level. I think it helps to, to sort of target your, to take your compliance people and maybe give them so many states or give them different agencies and so they're working that same agency and they develop that relationship again and, and know what that state wants or know what that agency wants. Um, <clears throat> some of the money that we recover does uh, go to the state. Some of it does go to our office. Um, and so that's generally a pretty small percentage. It certainly isn't, you know, a third, as you might see in, uh, in private class actions. It's usually uh, percentage-wise actually quite small um, w when, you, when you look at it. And then this last one is always um, a little bit of a confusing one for people, which is that we represent the state, not individuals. And that's true. Uh, you know, we, we do not, we are not class action attorneys. People think we are sometimes. We are not. And we do not represent individuals, either individually or collectively. We represent the state. However, our constituency is, of course, Iowans. And, and so a lot of times we, our actions benefit those people, but, uh, but they are not our clients. And sometimes counsel or the public have trouble understanding that. Um, so that's, that's just a technical point. <laughs> And, and I should note that our money that we get for our office only can go for consumer protection. Um, so it doesn't fund our AG's office. And so we can't, and there's a limit on what we can fund each, because each, uh, we sometimes get accused of, oh, you just want that money to keep your office going. Well, no, the, right. you know, the government limits, the state government limits what we can spend on consumer per year, and that money can only go to consumer, and we can use it for you know, reimbursement of some of our attorneys, but we use it for education, we use it for outreach. And then sometimes we've done, with larger settlements, we've done sort of grant programs where we've taken that money and given it back into the community, like legal aid, who might fight, you know, mortgage, mortgage foreclosure rescue the, or something like that, who would, who would work on the, the The Iowa Mortgage Help Hotline, which is 
something I've devoted an awful lot of time to. You know, that's been funded through some of my work. You know, we've kept that going, and that has helped tens of thousands of, of Iowans uh, keep their home uh, out of foreclosure. So yeah, we do uh, do other funding as well. Um, reaching the public, uh, obviously we talked about the complaints. We do have a monthly consumer advisory that gets sent out and obviously we change the topic on those and those go all over the place. Uh, you know, they sometimes get reprinted in small town newspapers, you know, just verbatim. Uh, we hear them on radio stations sometimes. That's all great. We, we encourage that. And so that's something we've done for a long time. Obviously, we put out press releases on all of the various things that we do. We, of course, have our website, and uh, you know, a lot of people contact us through the website. A lot of people contact us still through mail, um, but you can submit a complaint on our website and uh, public presentations such as the one here today. And, you know, Jessica talked about the State Fair. There's a lot of contact with the public at the State Fair. So there are just a lot of ways that, that people interact with our office. Um, okay, and some of this is repeating a little bit. You know, some of the, <clears throat> the criminal laws, uh, you know, telemarketing has been an area that our office has been a real pioneer in for a very long time. And there's a tremendous amount of fraud that happens through telemarketing. And Iowa has always been a rich target because of our uh, percentage of uh, the population that's elderly. And so it's something that we've taken very, very seriously. In fact, we um, have something that was developed before Jessica and I were in the office, but we, we have an undercover, we have an actual phone in our office, which is assigned to an elderly Iowan that scammers unwittingly call, and then we answer, we have a person who answers, and we record the call. And we have uh, taken many, many actions based on what we have learned um, from that. Right, that was the one time I was doing criminal stuff. I got to do a subpoena, criminal subpoena with a deep state mm -hmm. in our office who was leading it, and we actually got to raid one of these kind of office offices. Um, and, and I always like to leave my consumer presentations with like a piece of information. You can take home if you don't already know it, but that you don't, you're not going to use for your business, you're not going to use online, you're going to use personally. And it's something I can say is personally, it's never give money up over the phone. I don't even do it to my college alma mater or my law school alma mater. Always do it directly through them, either, you know, a written, I, I prefer the website these days going to their website and donating online. But too many of these uh, folks partner up and, and sound legitimate, like police, fire, fire folks, diabetes, and sometimes they actually legitimately have in the past partnered with those groups, but those groups get like 10, 15% of your money. Um, it's just, you're, you're the, much better off. The legitimate group gets right, 10, 15% of the money. 80, 85% goes to the professional and fundraiser. That, yeah. Fundraiser. And they're lying to you. And let me tell you, I've seen the, the video footage of them lying to you. And it's just like, yeah, I, it, it's interesting that you said that because I actually have the same policy. I don't give money out over the phone, period. End of story. Just don't because of what we have learned, I think, in, a, in our job. And, uh, and, that. Door -door. and so I didn't, we, didn't coordinate, we didn't coordinate that. I didn't know that was your policy as well. So, yes, sir. Selling wide variety of things, and it's for some program that's 
don't really put your finger on, but it sounds good, like helping people get off drugs or something. Is there a high degree of, of scamming? In yes. No? Re repeat the question. Oh, yes. Okay, so the question was about door-to-door -door activity in, in particular, I think, door-to-door uh, -door activity that has an ostensible charitable purpose. You're right. Magazine subscriptions is a big one that you see. And, and so the question is, is there a, is there a lot of fraud in that? And, uh, and the answer is yes. I mean, you're doing a disservice not only because your money's not going to, to a good thing, but those poor kids are usually sort of marked door to door and, and made to do that. And they're not doing this usually of their own volition. They've somehow gotten roped in by older adults. I mean, we've gone after them occasionally. It's been a few, a couple of years since we've done one of those. But um, again, I, you, Girl Scout cookies. You can buy Girl Scout cookies. Girl Scout, door door, we support the Girl Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> they do. But, or if you know it's your neighborhood kid looking for like pants to donate or something like that, but otherwise, no. I mean, those, those poor kids, you're only hurting them. I know it's hard to say no to them and they look, you know, really desperate and their cause sounds great. But again, you know, if it's a legitimate, take their name, say, you know, I'm going to go online and look at it. But, but I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we. Know that I'm home. I just no, I'm not. You, you know, you hate. You, you can never say a hundred percent, right? You can't. But there is definitely a high degree of questionable activity in those types of door-to-door -door solicitations. And even sometimes, I think legitimate, uh, legitimate sort of organizations get in with the fundraiser and they don't get as much money as you would think from that fundraiser, right? I mean. That the amount that they get is so small. I always encourage groups, and especially now that I'm a parent and I'm starting to get in these, to do non non sort of to do more organic and, and local fundraising where most of the money comes back to you. I think mean, again, you're better than giving cash to that organization than probably buying something. Plus, it's your child, and they're trying to, I guess, get a prize for selling so much stuff. Um, so we mentioned the Consumer Fraud Act previously. Again, it's Iowa Code uh, 714.16. One thing that I want to say about it is it's an extraordinarily broad statute, okay? And but there's a reason for that. Think about in our complex society all of the ways in which you could cheat someone, be deceptive towards someone, uh, you know, engage in an unfair or deceptive act, and. Uh, it's by design that it's that broad. And I think sometimes when we run up against counsel, there, there are a lot of counsel out there who specialize in dealing with attorneys general offices. Um, and a lot of times they're national counsel. And so actually I spend the vast majority of my time dealing with lawyers from New York, Washington, D.C. That's mostly where the lawyers that I deal with. I, I don't deal with a lot of Iowa lawyers. Um, and part of that is because of the types of things that that I've tended to work on, but sometimes we run into attorneys who aren't familiar with it, or judges who aren't familiar with it, and they kind of have this reaction of, well, that can't be, um, you know, that can't be the law because it's so very different than anything else that they're used to. And we can waste a lot of time and energy trying to get them to understand that, well, yeah, actually it is the law. And I think we're, some of the slides after this get into it a little bit more. But um, it, it's a very unique statute. And it's something that a lot of law schools don't teach, right? I mean, I mean how many people had a consumer class? I didn't. I don't even think there was one offered at the University of Michigan. I took a class on medieval Icelandic love feuds, but there were no consumer, <laughs> uh, consumer classes. So um, it's something that when you run into for the first time, you might think, wow, they have that sort of subpoena authority, and wow, right. merchandise is that broadly writ. Um, and it applies to, whoa, all those businesses. Um, right. At least what is looked at on the state level. When you get to private rights of consumer action, it's much more narrowly tailored. And I think that's a good thing. So the other thing, and Maybe, I don't, Jessica, you tell me if you want to, the Iowa Consumer Credit Code, which Jessica is our administrator of that, if you want to talk about that at this point, or if you want to do it later. Okay. Um, and then there are some federal laws that give rights to state attorneys general. 
Um, and so a lot of them are around telemarketing fraud. Uh, as you can see, there's something called the telemarketing sales rule, but then you know there's an odometer law, obviously involving cars. Um, and so that's just something that has happened, and I think is happening a little more than it used to. Where, yeah, and of course with the, with the Dodd Frank law, which is a very comprehensive law and was a very important law in for state attorneys general, um, we sometimes are given the ability to enforce federal law. Okay, so uh, recent areas of emphasis, mortgage fraud. Okay, that's me. That's what I've been doing um, pretty much since I joined the office. And it's been, um, what an interesting ride it's been. And so we started, I started in 2004, and we knew then, and we really figured it out in 2005, that there was massive fraud in the mortgage market, including the subprime mortgage market. And unfortunately, we were not listened to. And in fact, we were often painted as the bad guys. And so at, if you put yourself back then, you have a booming real estate market. Everybody's making money off of it, including the homeowners. And there was this catchphrase that was called the democratization of credit. So isn't this wonderful because as we're going down the credit, uh, you know, we're going from prime credit into subprime credit into really subprime credit, and these people are getting homes or are getting other consumer credit, and isn't that wonderful? Well, yeah, it is wonderful as long as it's actually sustainable. And what we figured out is that, it, um, you know, the way it was being done was through fraud. And, and it sounds funny now because, you know, it's been front page news for a long time and everybody just accepts it as fact. But we were warning against this a long time ago. And again, we were not only ignored, we were heavily criticized at every turn. And so there was a company called AmeriQuest, which you may or may not remember. They had some pithy TV ads and they advertised a lot. Their symbol was the Liberty Bell. And in fact, they sponsored Super Bowl halftime show. This is the that was a that was where I cut my teeth was doing that case. And and because somebody left, I actually was given the national leadership of that case when I had been in the office for all of one year. And so that was a real sink or swim moment for me personally. And uh, we settled with that company in January of 2006, okay? So it's public, big press conference out in LA at the California Attorney General's office. And it was covered, uh, you know, Nightline did a story on it. They were at the press conference, but it wasn't covered like you might think it was. And that party continued until August of 2007 when the subprime housing market collapsed virtually overnight. Now think about that. Think about how much time that is. We just had a settlement with the largest by far and the most prominent and the most visible subprime mortgage originator where 49 states and the District of Columbia settled with them and our, and our colleagues in the state banking departments also settled with them. And that didn't stop the party. The lending continued. In for, for a long period of time. And so one of the things that I want to convey by that, why I tell that story, is the first thing that everybody throws against us, including defendants, but others, is you're political. You're, this is just political, right? Yes, it is true that we work for elected officials. That is a true statement. But I will tell you that what we do is not political that you know, uh, we try very hard not to have things be political. I work with Democrats, I work with Republicans, I work with people all across the country, I work with people in every state, and I think Jessica probably does too. And that's one of the real pleasures of the job is we have friends in every state. Well, you know, people in Vermont and people in Arizona and people in Florida and people in Iowa don't always view the world the same way. Uh, under any circumstance, and then, and then, of course, you have, you know, maybe a Democrat or a Republican as the Attorney General in that state, and so um, that had a lot of traction 
back then, that what we were doing was political. And what I'm telling you is don't believe it. Don't believe it because we have widespread, broad authority under the laws that we enforce. And so for us to do something that doesn't need to be done, to be done for a non-legitimate purpose, other than the fact that it's wrong, would be a horrible mistake on our part because we have more work than we could ever do. And, and so I just want you to have an appreciation, and I feel very strongly about this, that you know, the work of the state attorneys general is not political. Now, there's 50 states out there. You get a new crop of AGs, you know, not a, they don't all turn over, but some do. I'm not going to tell you that nothing has ever been done ever by a state attorney general's office that had a political connotation, okay? I don't want to take it too far. But if you're in a situation where, especially where you're in a multi-state situation and, a, you know, a coordinated one, um, that is not a political act in my experience. And I've been at it 11 years now, often in a leadership position, almost, almost entirely. And uh, that, that's just, an, I think, an important point. And it's a huge mistake for the company to make. Uh, to take that approach. Instead, they need to start asking, well, why are we being contacted? You know, what is going on here? So, You know, I would double down on that, especially in our office. I think Tom Miller hires without regard to political party. We have Republicans, we have Democrats in our office who never ask that question. Um, what is more is important to him and to us is what we see coming through and how we see people being hurt. For example, the, in the mortgage case, I mean, we saw those cases come through. We saw inflated appraisals. We saw, you know, falsified income coming through in 2004, 2005. And like Patrick, I, Patrick was doing the case. I was going over to the legislature answering those questions, and I was treated like sort of a young, naive girl who how could I not understand what the mortgage market did and what that I, I was crazy to be saying that, oh, especially yeah. at, you know, sort of. 10 years ago being younger, they thought I was, I didn't know what I was talking about. But a lot of stuff comes from what we see in the complaints, which again, getting, getting back to answering those complaints in a thorough manner and really looking at them and having good compliance only helps your, your company. And if you want to know where something's coming from, it's usually because we've heard about it through a consumer complaint. They're not always. I mean, sometimes we will, you know, get alerted to it by a group or we'll just see an ad or something on TV that strikes us as wrong or a bad practice. And we really are... I mean, in our office, and I think at the large majority of AG's offices, they're just trying to do the right thing and, and protect consumers. Right. So I, won't, I used to give hour and a half speeches just about mortgages. I'll spare you that today. Um, and in fact, things are much better now. Um, but uh, I still spend almost all of my time on mortgages. It's not the origination. It's not the creation of the mortgage, which is what I was doing at the beginning, it's the mortgage servicing, which is that involves foreclosures, and there's obviously been a lot in the news about that. And I continue to spend my time on that. I do believe there will be a day when I no longer work on mortgages, but I, uh, it hasn't come yet. Um, charitable solicitations we've already kind of hit on. Uh, again, we've really been uh, a national leader in this for a very long time. Uh, that has not been my area of emphasis. There's another person in the office who spends a lot of time on this, and it's it's something that we're very proud of. Um, you know, I you know I could give you 50 pages of of stuff that we work on, but you know, free trials, the free to pay conversions, it's a technique I think you're all familiar with, especially when you see like uh, TV ads for stuff, and so. Oh, you get something, and if you don't call up in 60 days and cancel it, then you're automatically enrolled in, in such and such program. That's a way that um, a lot of fraudulent um, or <clears throat> like membership groups, uh, different things, it's just, there's a lot of problems with that. Ten dollars now, and you forget to click out of it. We had the large, we had a, a settlement with a company called Virtue, 
it was about $40 million, and they wouldn't settle. Here's an example. They had counsel that fought, 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 fought. They had, I mean, we just, and again, we want to protect Iowa consumers. We're going to keep them out of Iowa, give Iowans their money back. They wouldn't do it. Fought, fought, fought. Took it up to the Supreme Court. $40 million later uh, is what they ended up with again. And they had a chance to get out for so much less. But that $40 million, most of it went, the lion's share was back to the Iowans. I would say $37 million. We got some attorney fees and costs for going to pay. That was just an Iowan only case. Yeah. It covered over 400,000 Iowans, including people in our own office who didn't realize these charges were on their credit card. Um, they didn't, I mean, you guys are all financial folks, so you probably look over your credit card charges, but these charges seemed to be like a legitimate product. They list themselves and, and seem to be sort of like ID, identity protection, identity theft. And so people would, because I did some of these depositions, and you go and you depose these consumers who had no idea that this charge, that would increase $10 every year. It's a monthly charge. It started out at like $19.95. Some of these people ended up at 100 bucks a month by the time they interviewed them, especially the elderly islands. They just they would have an explanation for it. One thought she was paying off pots and pans. Lots of them thought they were ID theft. I think only less than 5% of the people actually knew they belonged to this. So um, again, always be careful when you click that money off. I never take those money off offers. I never listen to them. And the, and the point of the Vertrue case, too, is that um, to state the obvious, we took that case to trial. And we won at trial. And then, of course, it was appealed. But I think sometimes people make the mistake that they think, oh, you guys won't you won't take it to trial. It's not true. <laughs> it is absolutely not true. And I think it's important that, that, that people realize that. Um, For-profit colleges and universities, this is what Jessica is spending all her time on these days. You know, big, um, big area, uh, uh, sort of where we're seeing lots of fraud, we're seeing people who shouldn't. Um, these kind of don't know what they're getting, spending $80,000 on a legal degree. Um, we're seeing lots of problems. Um, it, of course, there's a kind of for student funding, and then they're getting put in private loans, and sometimes good legitimate companies have signed up for these for profits, and oops, the default rate ends up being in excess of 60%. Um, so <laughs> not only are the students suffering, but um, the legitimate company that thought they had a good deal with the for profit college is also um, discovering that, that they don't. So that's a huge area of general voters right now. And, we are leading a multi-state investigating four different for-profit colleges right now. We've got some individual Iowa investigations going on as well. And we're also looking at um, the lead generators, the folks who get uh, the, the leads um, online to, to the schools. And then the schools make cold calls. These for-profit colleges, a lot of them run what we call boiler rooms. And that's, again, telephone solicitations where they'll call you up. And it's not the traditional way you think of applying to school. Um, and it's actually very sad because these people are sold a bill of goods and they think they're going to better themselves and they just end up with debt they can never get rid of in Title IV um, student loans. Uh, used cars, obviously there's a lot of issues out there. Uh, we have one full-time car person, uh, uh, an investigator, handles um, a lot of issues. Uh, one of the first things I did in the office was a large uh, used, used car case. So that, that was really almost like a financing case, actually. It just so happened that what they were selling were cars. Uh, and Jessica works on, on, on cars as well. Yeah, I do a lot of the car financing, um, a lot of the biker takers, um, but, but also new car financing and new car stuff. And that's one where... I think whatever we threw at it, we could probably fill the resources. There's just a lot of, a lot of issues. And we have several people doing by your takers across the state forever because unfortunately, um, you have these people who set up shop and they're lending, right? They're lending and they don't quite understand all the intricacies of lending. So. Um, well, this is a CLE, and so uh, this is getting into the guts of our statute a little bit. And so, okay, great. What you know, UDAP, an unfair, deceptive act or practice. What does that mean? Well, okay, what's deception? It's an act which has a tendency or capacity to mislead a substantial number of consumers about a material fact or facts. All right. The next points are the big ones, though. We do not have to prove reliance and we do not have to prove harm. People have a hard time wrapping their head around this because, again, you have to understand that the, the people are not our client. And so what if, 
our job is to prove that the bad act took place. And then we are there to punish that bad act or to help remediate that bad act. And so we don't have to prove intent, which is another one that people sometimes have a really hard time wrapping their head around. And so um, our threshold is pretty low. Uh, and again, it's by design because we are there as the counsel for the state of Iowa to, to show that the bad activity took place and to root that bad activity out of the marketplace. We are not representing individuals, and I think this is where the rubber hits the road on that point, where we're not having to prove reliance or damage or intent. But now, let's be clear, there's a difference between what you have to actually prove and what you choose to pursue. And one of the challenges of our job is, what do you spend your time on, right? Because it really is a challenge. We don't have clients like the people in the admin division do, right? Where there's an actual agency and there's a, you know, a person who calls them up and says, hey, I got an issue because we have an employment dispute or this or that or whatever. That doesn't happen to, to us in the consumer protection division. And so many of the things in which we do bring in action, well, people absolutely were damaged by it, even though we don't have to prove it. And people very oftentimes very much relied upon the deception that led to that damage. But so I mean, I want to. But if but if we're down in you know Polk County courthouse trying the case, those are not elements that we have to prove. Yeah, and it's different again. It's the private actor bringing this claim. And again, this is sort of the reason everyone learns about common law fraud in law school. So that's why you think that there needs to be reliance and there needs to be damage and there needs to be intent. But it, as Patrick says, it's not common law fraud, it's consumer fraud, and it's strict at those things. But that we're not going to bring, again, we have too much too much to look at to bring something that's harming no one, really. In the right. Yeah. That, that would not be a good use of our time. And I can't think of an example where we no. would have done that. Um, <clears throat> unfairness. Not everybody has the U in UDAP, which is unfairness. Most people do. Uh, but not every state has it, and that's an act of practice which causes substantial unavoidable injury not outweighed by any consumer or competitive benefit the practice produces. Um, deception is easier, right? You can understand deception. You can understand misrepresentation. Um, unfairness is not used as frequently as deception, but it is used. And, and we have used it, and the, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, they also have unfairness jurisdiction. Okay, so what's unfair? Um, and look, I, I, you know, I will be the first one to admit that sometimes this is a little bit of the eye of the beholder because of the broadness of it. But clearly selling defective merchandise, I think, could be labeled an unfair practice. Uh, selling dangerous products, uh, something I, I don't think e either of us personally worked on, but a group of states um, became very concerned about these products where it mixes in a can caffeine and alcohol. And uh, this is being done by you know, the big companies. You know, the, uh, this is not being done by little niche companies. And there was a lot of concern about that. And that, um, <clears throat> I think they got at that through the, through the unfairness um, prong. And then, uh, you know, for, for going a legitimate cure for a disease, we see a lot of that, a lot of the fraudulent medical claims. Again, we sometimes do those that's we, we could do those all day every day because there there's so many of them or or other things where you're somehow foregoing a legitimate right that you have or a benefit that you have because of this other attempt to um, pretend that someone's a governmental agency or just any of anything that you might be able to imagine 
Um, misrepresentations kind of speaks for itself. Um, I just mentioned this, claims of official approval. There's a lot of government lookalikes, so people who are out there to try to get you to pay $80 for a copy of a, your deed when you can go get that for free. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that, and they have seals and, you know, a Washington, D.C. return address and all of this stuff where they try to make you think that they're state or federal government. Um, you know, any time, any guarantees that are across the board, a guaranteed credit repair claim, a guarantee that we'll be able to finance you no matter what, right? Uh, things like that. You can get into trouble with that, as you might be able to imagine. Um, you know, deception and misrepresentation are very similar, although not necessarily uh, identical. Uh, omissions. So we, we, our statute does cover omissions. And um, the one thing about omission is that it must be a material fact. Yeah, it has to be an omission of a material fact for it to run afoul of, of our consumer fraud act. And we do bring actions of, on omissions, although many times if there's an omission, there's usually a deception as well or some other aspect. Uh, you know, they kind of, if people are willing to engage in dishonest, unlawful conduct, they don't usually limit themselves to one particular thing. So we're usually able to get at it in multiple ways. Um, there are a lot of laws that cross-reference uh, the Attorney General's office or our Consumer Fraud Act. So again, the Consumer Credit Code, which Jessica is going to talk about, the one question that, that we got about the Door-to-Door -door Sales Act, there's a specific law about that. If you're going to go door-to-door, -door, what are the requirements? What kind of notice do you have to provide? What is the cooling off period in which a person can undo a door-to-door -door transaction? Um, there's a lot of <clears throat> automobile specific laws um, that reference our office as well. And I, I'm not trying to give you a, a comprehensive list. Uh, I'll give you one more. Yeah, I like your little nugget of consumer law that you can take home personally. Lemon law, most people don't know. Credit <coughs> cards and lemon cards, you can get in. It's only a lemon, mm -hmm. and it only will apply if your car is two years and has to be under two years or 24,000 miles, whichever comes first. And you have to have three or more chances at them to fix the same problem. So just, again, it's not financial, but uh, I, just a little bit. And it's one we get a lot of calls on, and people say, yeah, they're violating the lemon law. Well, yeah. Act right. So buy, if you're buying a new car, just be aware. Again, a little bit of take home. This is, a, this is a big issue in our world, which is the issue of federal preemption, uh, which I think everybody knows that would be the concept of, hey, federal law prevails and state law doesn't, and in fact it's nullified. There has quite frankly been a pitched battle on this over the, the last decade over what is the line between federal preemption and, and state law, and in particular, on consumer finance so issues. It's not consumer finance. I mean, look at this list. Mm -hmm. It's actually outside. So I know we have right. room and have to kind of focus a lot of uh, our energy on financial preemption, but that preemption battle gets waged in different areas as well. And and it's um, you know on the financial part there there's been litigation. Uh, that has gone up to the United States Supreme Court on the issue. And then, of course, what was a sea change was the Dodd-Frank law, which um, keeping it at a level of generality um, was beneficial to the states on the issue of preemption and consumer finance issues. And uh, as was mentioned in my introduction, I had the the, the responsibility and privilege of being the national assistant attorney general uh, on the what's become known as the national mortgage settlement and uh, I don't believe that that would have been possible absent the changes that occurred in Dodd-Frank and so 
um, we were able to deal with what are called national banks, which are banks that have a federal charter under the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, as opposed to banks that are licensed by, say, the Iowa Division of Banking. Um, we had a very different relationship with national banks post Dodd-Frank and post some Supreme Court uh, rulings than we had before then. And so that's really been a big change that's happened very directly to what I do every day um, and probably for Jessica as well. And the thing I just say about preemption is it's an interesting issue um, and it doesn't cut cleanly across party lines. And, you know, depending on the issue, you'll have different people saying there should be one federal standard. We can't have this patchwork of you know, 50 different standards out there, and then you have people saying this is a total overreach by the federal government, and, you know, we're for state rights, and we need to preserve our ability to address this issue as, you know, how Iowa wants to address it, and um, there's not always consistency there, I guess, is, is what I would say, and because we work in a state attorney general's office, we don't like to be preempted. Uh, I don't think there's any surprise there, and um, I really do think because of my experience with uh, what happened with mortgages that that was an issue where preemption hurt this country very badly uh, because we did not have the power over national banks that we have now, and, um, and I do believe that things would have been different if uh, state attorneys general had had that power and um, we had been, quite frankly, listened to in a, in, in a way that, that we were not. Preemption is a complicated subject. I think Jessica is more of an expert on preemption than me, uh, quite honestly. We could give a whole presentation on, on preemption, but, uh, but we won't do that. I don't know if you want to add anything at this point. Um, I think we've seen less preemption in, in the financial areas. I remember when I first came to the office, we had many, many, many preemption cases going on, a lot of them centering around mortgages, um, with a lot of law public cases going up and down. And what, some of the first stuff I've ever done at Mika Street Supreme Court, um, uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court level, right when I got here, I'm helping out with those and getting those filed, not doing the, the lion's share of the drafting. It was still too free at that point. Um, but we still see it, like I said, in other areas, in other credit areas. Um, Iowa has an Electronic Transfer Funds Act. Um, it's, your, it's our ATM Act. And that thing keeps getting challenged. And I somehow have become the preemption mm -hmm. person. Even though Division of Banking is not my client, um, I somehow have become the person, maybe because I've admitted in federal court, um, to argue and continually mostly lose these cases. Um, so these were like the cases a long time ago, a decade, 15 years ago, that didn't allow ATM fees in Iowa, lost that one, and then uh, we've lost, that, that act keeps getting chipped away at. There were some protections about sort of central routing authorities, and again, I won't bore you, but that, so preemption does. It's a, it's a huge issue, and it has very real day-to-day -day impacts on people, at, you know, when something does get preempted. Um, we kind of covered this already. This is the free-to-pay issue, the Vertru lawsuit, which was mentioned, uh, which was a big victory for our office. And that's, that's, in, that's a technique that is used across many different spaces, many different types of things. And so I would just, I would just urge you to be cautious uh, about anyone who is using that technique as a way to get you to sign up for their service or their product. Um, I think we talked about this as well, charitable solicitations. And again, the thing that people really don't understand is that if somebody is using a professional fundraiser, 80, 85 percent, maybe more, is going to the professional fundraiser. Very little of your dollar is going to the charitable purpose. And I think that that's just a fundamental point that we would like more people to be aware of and, and to not respond to professional fundraisers. To, to, you know, if there's a charitable purpose that you want to contribute to, and by all means, we want people to contribute to charity, 
that you do it, um, you know, directly to that to that company. Um, purpose of consumer protection law. This is the, you know, I gave the disclaimer about opinions. This is where this really might come into play. We get tagged with the anti-business label sometimes. I think nothing could be less true. I think that we are incredibly pro-business because what we're doing is there are people out there, and, and th here I'm not talking about the the frauds, right? Here I'm talking about more of what I would call the, you know, the legitimate businesses. There are businesses that get a leg up. There are businesses that gain more revenue because they are engaging in, in a deception in some sort of behavior that they should not be. And I think it is incredibly pro-business to remove that from the marketplace. To, so that you have the level playing field and that the person who is following the rules, the person who is following the law, is not being penalized for doing so. And believe me, that happens all the time. And so um, I think it is about ensuring fairness in the marketplace and obviously just stopping bad behavior and helping to remediate that harm. Uh, when we are able to. Uh, I want to finish up here so Jessica has some time. You know, you can contact us if you're here and locally, of course, that's our local number. We have a toll-free number and, and we have our website. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to let Jessica uh, share, yeah, stand up and share a few things. So thank you. Okay, I don't have a separate PowerPoint. I think my job was to put more of the F into this, the financial part, part of this, into this presentation. Um, what I will add, and um, Patrick and I worked on this, and so I should have added this earlier, but I, I think another area we focus on and something that we can work together with financial services are elder fraud. Um, there, are special, there are increased penalties under our act for uh, defrauding the elderly, and what we see with respect to financial um, fraud on the elderly uh, a lot of times we see it at financial institutions, and, the, and I know you guys, the, the folks on the financial institution side see it. They see the elderly Iowan marched in with sort of the young, it's usually a male, but sometimes female, um, and the elderly Iowans withdrawing $20,000 out of their bank account. And you know that triggers the SARS report, but um, uh, we have folks in our office, we've got a, an attorney who represents division of the, the elder, elder affairs, and she works with um, which is a great presentation. She could have been here today, but works with financial institutions to teach them how to, how to deal with that and how to separate. It's best if you can separate that elderly person and, and the financial scammer. But there's a lot we do there um, trying to protect the elderly, especially because, you know, in Iowa we have a large elderly population and they tend to be very trusting. And I also think there's some neuroscience that shows that as you age, um, you, you tend to become more trusting or, or more willing, and then these poor elderly Iowans um, end up with no savings. Um, so we do a lot um, with financial we, fraud. We've prosecuted some of those cases. Oh, too. we do. Yeah. We do. Um, we definitely prosecute them. The unfortunate part is those people have often spent the money. That, that money is gone, right? Like they've taken several hundred thousand dollars away from the elderly Iowan, and, and it's just it's their life savings. We had a woman, an elderly widow, um, she had her farm, $750,000, all gone. Um, she lost everything. We couldn't, I think we got 50000 back when it was all said and done. The guy got put in jail. That was one of those parallel proceedings I, I helped work on. Um, he had been her legitimate investment advisor, and then he left, and he took clients with them. Um, so to the extent possible, if, if financial institutions see that going on, they see one of their employees leaving and leaving with a lot of clients, and they're really suspicious, to the extent possible, again, we encourage people to come talk with us. Um, and like I said, we do a lot of educating and trying to work um, with financial organizations, because you guys don't want this going on either. You know it's your lifelong customer and you see it happening. Um, and I think we work together best when we, we try and prevent that, that fraud from happening. So, um, But again, focusing on the F, um, as Patrick said, I do the Iowa Consumer Credit Code. For those of you who are not um, state chartered financial institutions, um, it's something you probably don't even think about too much because, again, of that preemption law, we're preempted. Um, but it's consumer credit transactions, so consumer loans, consumer credit sales, 
um, leases, uh, rental transactions, things of that nature. Um, it tracks the TILA limit, so anything purchases or credits, like credit extended up to, I think it's what, $54,000 these days, um, falls under the jurisdiction of the Consumer Credit Code. It's actually out of our office, but we work closely with the Division of Banking, Division of Credit Unions, um, as they're sort of the primary financial regulators. The people I mostly regulate, and I use that term loosely because they file a notification, um, directly are those uh, folks that engage in credit sales because they're sort of outside the boundaries of, of having a traditional financial license. Um, and again, those are the people that I see the most sort of harm coming from. They do things like calculate their interest rate improperly. I go after lots of car dealers who um, use an old, old school method of calculating interest rate and it, it, they'll claim it's 12% when in actuality it's 30%, right? Because they don't take the declining balance into effect. Things like that nature, they charge people fees all the time that they can't. Um, so that's, um, that's sort of the credit code in a nutshell. The part that does apply to um, national banks is of course the debt collection stuff, you know, debt collection not being preempted. Um, so then in our Debt Collection Act, our Iowa Debt Collection Practices Act is under the Consumer Credit Code. Um, it's broadly writ. It captures first party creditors um, as well as third parties. Uh, the Federal Debt Collection Practices Act only covers third parties, although I think that's all, as always open for consideration. Um, but our Iowa Debt Collection Practices Act does cover um, first party creditors and it covers a broad range of transactions. It covers transactions that would have been consumer credit transactions had interest been charged or the transaction been done in a monthly installment. So it gets all your hospital bills, your cell phone bills, everything. Um, and like I said, we work closely with other divisions. I'm going to sort of speed through this so we have time for questions. So I'm just highlighting some, some of what I've seen and talking with other state friends and federal friends is what I see as sort of big financial regulation issues. A lot of these are going to be CFPB centered. Um, I seem to be talking with them and working with them a great deal lately. Um, the first one though, I think you're going to see it at, done at a state level as well as the federal level. Um, subprime auto lending um, is huge uh, these days. We have our, you know, the standard sort of old, what I would call old school subprime auto lending, where hey, there's no underwriting done. That's usually those buy here, pay here's. Um, I saw, I see, unfortunately these are mostly Iowa credit unions and, and I always sort of feel for them and want to work with them, but they get, I would also say, taken in by car dealers. Not that all car dealers are bad, don't get me wrong, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying, but there are some, some more shady characters sometimes and um, they don't do any underwriting, they sell salvage cars, the credit union hasn't, you know, or a bank didn't do their due diligence, buys the paper from them or finances the consumer for a loan and there's all sorts of problems. Um, Financing negative equity, that was an old, sort of old school subprime lending thing, not letting the consumer know that you're rolling over one old loan into your new loan, not, no proper disclosure. We had big concerns with add-on products. Um, those concerns still linger, of course, but sort of the new concerns and what I think you're going to see states focusing on, um, as well as others. I mean, I, there's a big New York Times piece. Um, I know we have um, folks in the audience who work on this. Um, but is the, con the, the securitization of the, of the subprime auto loans. I mean, that's a huge concern. Again, the lack of underwriting we see and people buying this paper without the underwriting. A lot of these have led to what we saw in the mortgage case, quite frankly. I've started seeing complaints where car dealers who, you know, fill out the form, right, fill out the form for the consumer. Um, they play sort of the five-finger game, they cross it over, or they have just the consumer sign the paperwork. Um, they, I've seen them inflating income. I've seen them take a one and add a four, um, so that a one, you know, $1,900 a month income became a $4,900 a month income and got them qualified for the loan, and then that loan got repackaged and securitized. So again, that's something that's similar that happened in the mortgage market because this, this person wouldn't have qualified for that loan, but for that falsification of income, and the person actually wasn't in on it. Um, and then, of course, the reason it probably came to us was because the person got in over their head because they never should have been in this loan in the first place, and they're falling behind, and they didn't even realize the falsification occurred because they didn't see it until I subpoenaed the paperwork to find it. So, and I've seen that several times over, done different ways. Um, I don't know how often people like to buy cars. It's one of those things I hate doing. I only will do if absolutely necessary and my car is on its last leg. Um, I just hate the, the inequities of information and all the stuff that can go along out there, but we, a lot of times consumers get trapped in that dealer room and the F&I room and they feel like they can't leave for five hours and they end up signing deals or they end up signing blank paperwork. Um, and that's how some of this happens too. Um, so we've seen the falsification of income, I've seen inflating the value of the car, 
um, giving the car more features than it actually has so that you're raising it up several thousand dollars, taking miles off the car, not actually on your odometer paperwork, but on your financing paperwork. So it seems like you've got bigger security there than you actually have. Um, and again, this is all because these car dealers aren't keeping these loans, right? Um, and neither is the person that the car dealer is assigning the loan to. It's getting securitized again. So I'm seeing this happen, and we, we're getting this now. We have a weekly meeting where we actually handle car complaints. And um, I would say we're seeing at least one of these either falsification or inflating the value of the car um, going on. Um, we're also seeing uh, repossession concerns about, okay, now this is securitized. Who's, who's following this? What company's handling the proper repossession procedures? That's all done by state law, doing the right title, um, following the right notice of right to cures, et cetera. So um, you're definitely going to see state AGs that we are looking at this um, um, on, on multiple fronts. Not only securitization, we're looking on sort of the large, more lenders that more keep this in-house, um, large buy-here payers. There are some nationwide buy-here payers. Buy-here payers tend to be a lo more localized thing, but there are some companies that have spread out and at least if not are nationwide or regional. Um, so heads up on that. Um, again, I've been talking a lot with the CFPB, and we'll just do quick overviews of this. But uh, CFPB has their credit card market study coming out, um, and they've got comments on that. Uh, you know, there's, under the CARD Act, they have to do this every two years. I think they last did this in 2013. Um, the, per the rules, the study is supposed to always look at how um, the CARD Act has affected the market. It, you know, you look at cost to the consumers, availability of credit, how complicated are the disclosures, complexity of agreements, et cetera. Um, the last time the report focused on add-on products, um, sort of and higher fee cards and deferred interest. I think you then saw the CFPB take some action in those areas. Um, this time, again, sort of highlighting what CFP might, be, might do in the future. Um, they're going to focus, they've requested special comments on the ability to repay standards and um, how credit card debt is sold. So when a company wants to charge off the debt, um, how are they selling it? But also if they're using third-party collectors, first of all, I should back up. If, um, if they're using third-party collectors, how the company is doing that, or when they sell that debt, how is that being sold and the issues going down the line? Um, I think consumer, especially credit, uh, credit card debt is a huge issue. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, affidavit, we've seen affidavit fraud, <laughs> we saw robo-signing as, as we saw in the mortgage market, we've seen it in the credit card world, um, you know, an employee at a large um, financial institution signing 2,000 affidavits a day attesting to the, you know, that that's what this person owed. Um, and you'll see some action there, I think joint and federal action together, um, trying to clean that up. But I think you also have a huge problem. And I think this is bad for the financial institutions, quite frankly, that this debt gets sold, it gets packaged and sold, and then they lose all control of it. And um, a lot of times this debt gets sold again and again and again, and we call it zombie debt. Sometimes it's not legitimate. Um, it turns out that, again, because that debt might not have been verified or something happened or it got paid off at one level, um, and it haunts that poor consumer as it gets sold again and again and again. Um, I think you're going to look at what, what can that consumer do, what can that original creditor do to help that consumer out, how can we prevent that, that zombie debt that's not legitimate debt um, from haunting that consumer, or legitimate debt that gets fees added on to illegally. What do you need to prove up that legitimate debt? I think these are things that um, I know CFPD is going to look at when they also look at their debt collection rules, um, which is, leads me to my second topic, trying to finish up here, uh, or the second CFPB topic, rather, CFPB debt collection rules. Um, I think last, in November 2013, they did an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. When did they, when did we submit comments? I think we submitted comments February or March of 2014. Um, I led the state uh, group that submitted, the state AGs that submitted comments. I think, if I'm remembering right, don't quote me on this, but I think the CFPB received over 20,000 comments on their debt collection notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, and I think you'll see it focusing on, you know, not only third-party collectors, but like I said, first-party collectors. Uh, what you'll, so you'll see the digital age moving debt collections into the digital age, but you'll also see this issue of, of selling debt and, and what happens once that debt gets downstream in the commerce. I think that's a, a very big deal. And then very recently, CFPB, uh, was it March 26th, they did their payday loan high interest rules. Um, high interest rate loan rules um, and their proposed rules. So of course they're going to accept comment on them now, and they're not quite fully fleshed out.
but they have two sets of rules, one for short-term high interest, um, and those loans are defined as loans under uh, 45 days or less. And they sort of have two options for lenders that want to do this. Um, and, and these rules, I should say, spring out um, of a study that CFPB had done on payday loans, where they looked at about 12, payday, 12 million payday loans, um, and only 15% of the borrowers could repay the loan at 14 days, which is when they're typically due. And over, like, about two-thirds renewed a loan 10 times in a given year. Um, so CFPB kind of, that's where they're coming from when they drafted these rules. They saw these as more of a debt trap. So like I said, they have the short-term high interest. Those are 45 days or less. Um, they're going to give you two options as lenders if you want to handle these. One, you can do a verification of income, a sort of ability to repay analysis, full underwriting like you normally do. And then you still have to adhere to what they're calling a 60-day cooling off period, where they ideally would like 60 days off between consumer loans. Um, but you can make a second one or up to a third one if you can demonstrate that the consumer has the ability to repay. Um, so that would be option one. Option two, um, you don't have to do the ability to repay analysis or ability to repay analysis. Um, it's for loans that are $500 or less. But you have to adhere to certain um, other limits. You have to provide an affordable repayment schedule. You have to limit the number of uh, loans a borrower can take out. You have to, um, that 60-day cooling off period needs to be established. Um, you can't have a consumer in debt for over 90 days in a 12-month period. Um, like I said, it's, you're limited to $500 or less, one finance charge, and you can't do, take a car title for those loans. Um, and they're talking about sort of the, these repayment plans, they're talking about sort of two tracks there, maybe potentially limiting loan payments to 5% of the consumer's income, or providing an affordable way, no, no cost off-ramp is what they're calling it, out of debt. And then the second option, or the second track of these loans are the longer term loans, what I would call the more traditional installment loans, um, oh, greater than 45 days, and where the lender has access to a borrower's checking account, either through automatic withdrawal or a, a post-dated check, and the APR is greater than 36%. They have two options, again, that ability to re repay analysis, or um, you have to adhere to stricter standards. And for all of these, um, they're, they're going to request... Um, they were going to require borrower, for no, borrower notification before accessing the, uh, the bank account. And they want, to, they want to limit the unsuccessful withdrawal attempts because that's what really gets the consumer, those repeated pings that trying to get money out of the checking account. And it really hurts the consumer because it racks up the late fees. And finally, sort of what I see on the horizon, and this is more of a warning for, for all of you out in financial, um, who work with financial or consumer lending, we're seeing a, a much as we saw the mortgage rescue uh, foreclosure scams, we're now seeing large amounts of student debt collection relief scams. Um, this is huge right now. And <laughs> these are, again, I think even worse because, as we know, they're almost impossible to discharge in bankruptcy, so you take the student down into even more debt. Um, but we're seeing companies call up students, offer to help them negotiate payment plans on federal student loans, um, which they could do for free with the government or with their loan servicer. Um, and the federal government now has income-based repayment plans and all sorts of deferment and things that they're happy to work with the borrowers on. But um, these scammers convince the borrowers they need them. They often will, uh, like the mortgage foreclosure rescue, they will say you can't talk to your lender anymore. They'll cut off communication. They'll get access um, to your Title IV loans or your private loans. I mean, they're doing this both. They try and they sell it as both private loans and um, Title IV loans and they're just getting these students down a deeper and deeper debt trap, and then sometimes committing ID theft with all the information they've gotten from these students. Um, so if your borrowers come in, and we've had problems with poor uh, student loan servicers, but both private and federal loan servicers, um, who try to stop their consumers from um, partaking in these scams, and we've had a couple consumers call us angry that their servicer was trying to prevent them from getting scammed. Um, and, and I mean, these, that's how good of a job they do at convincing consumers that they are, um, they are there to help them and they're the only way. And like I said, it only hurts the consumer and the financial institution. So it, and I know we're working with several federal student loan servicers to try and address this, but we're also going after, these are the bad guys. I mean, these are, right, these are the fly-by-night bad guys that we go after and don't really negotiate with. Um, they're a bunch of laws they're breaking. Uh, including debt collection laws, or uh, debt relief laws and debt management laws in Iowa and, and other states and federal laws. So that's kind of my high overview. With a few minutes till five, we'll take any general questions um, that you have, or not, because it's almost five <laughs> on a Thursday. Yeah? I have a question. How 
How is the organization of the CFPB affected your work you know, on a day-to-day -day basis to kind of like hold on to all this stuff? Sure. Um, it, it's affected it a lot. <laughs> And um, it, it's changed over time as they've grown, right? I mean, uh, having watched them sort of be born in 2011 and get more and more staff and divide up more and more, um, it, it's been, I think, only for the good. We've worked together well. Um, we don't, we share with them, they share with us. We both try and come up with ideas and solutions. Um, and. and I, th I think we've needed each other. Um, we are more sort of, I think, closer to the ground, more police on the beat, closer to the consumers than they are. They have more resources than us. <laughs> um, they have, I mean, they have a whole like section devoted to sort of market analysis or researchers, or even like say, I I'm doing the for-profit case and we're trying to do better for-profit disclosures and streamline them into like a one-page disclosure with the highlights and, and actually get consumers to read it, which who knows, you know, disclosures. But um, they have a whole like design team that can help us out, which we never had before. Um, so it, I, I think it's only, it's only been good. It, it has added a complex layer and sometimes, I mean, I figured it out now. You have to figure out who you want to contact within what division of the CFPB, but. Um, yeah, I mean, they hired a lot of our former colleagues. There's a lot of state people who work CFPB. They pay and, better than us. <laughs> and, um, there is a lot of, it, it was designed, in, if you look at the creation of the CFPB and the Dodd-Frank law, it was designed for there to be more state federal coordination. And, and we have had state federal coordination in more recent years, but I think that that's a good thing. And I think that that's going to be one of the lasting impacts of the CFPB as how it relates, you know, our jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, for example, I, I'll just do, give the for-profit example. I mean, CFPB has the lending, a private loan um, a jurisdiction over for-profit colleges. And they've been wanting to go after, and they've been going after them, and we've been going after them, and we combine forces. And it's been easier, and the companies have appreciated it. I mean. We work together. If, if finances are involved, we're pretty much working with them these days. And they provide a good resource for us as well. So, and they like our input. Um, they always solicit us for comments just because they want to know what we have to say. So, I know that um, in other states at the county level or at the city level that sometimes those um, government agencies will affiliate with a law firm to sort of handle the case for them. Um, on their behalf. Did that happen in Iowa and you guys ever done that? At the attorney general level? So the question, I, I forgot, we were supposed to repeat the question, sorry, bad presenter. Um, the question is, um, at, at the city and county level, um, sometimes city and counties will coordinate with private law firms and the private law firms will bring, bring a claim on, on behalf of the city or county. Or, and so you're asking, does does it, it happen does, at the AG level? Does the AG office? And I think the answer is sometimes. I mean, we have retained law firms. Um, sometimes in, in um, on the defense side, we've retained law firms where maybe they're it's, it's rare, but there might be an issue where somebody has a particular experience or expertise or something, and so. Um, it, it can happen. It does happen. I don't think it happens a lot in our office I, as a general I, rule. But yeah, it does happen from time to time. It, it happens, especially on the defense side, when our office might have given advice to an agency yeah. that runs counter. Um, yeah, there could be conflicts. That, and so we've conflicted ourselves out. Um, the agency's either chosen not to listen to us or wants a, a outside counsel. Um, right. uh, so that happens. That happens. On the consumer level, it happens in other states sometimes. They will hire um, outside counsel to bring the consumer cases. Um, and I think you've seen with uh, sort of more arbitration clauses going in, um, and that's another area CFPB is taking comments on, but they just released that study. But um, you've seen uh, private counsel try and I think actively solicit AGs because you know some of their traditional class action bread and butter is drying up to um, bring consumer actions on behalf of the AG, but our office has not done so. We we all, we do our own cases. It, yeah, it, it, it can be controversial, and and uh, you know you see you see it's big country out there. You see different responses in in different states. Other questions. 
you guys put up with us for an hour and a half. thank you very much. you can always contact us.